So, uh, the genesis of the idea, it started when uh, Creighton wanted to use ICE. Probably a lot of you are familiar with that project. And it was just at the very initial stages, and it's, I'm pretty sure that Dr. Miller has taken that over and advanced it uh, quite a bit uh, back to then, so that was back when I worked at Morocco. The idea that came about, like, could you supply my ventilation with liquid air? And, and after costing out and figuring out, it turned out to be no, uh, because it's too expensive and it will freeze everyone. <laughs> so the game-changing idea came about with high view energy and energy storage. And this is not new, and that's part of the theme that I'm going to uh, put across here. Things are, are not, uh, as you've seen, the, the battery and so on is, is uh, not necessarily new. We need an energy storage record uh, because we, we're changing our systems. We're reducing carbon. Uh, we're trying to introduce renewables into systems, and they're not controllable. You get energy when the wind blows. So adding storage to a system helps balance the grid. And so that's one of the things I'm discussing here is grid size, energy balancing technology. So if you look at flexible generation, well, can you make the wind blow when you want? No. Uh, interconnection, well, can you connect over to New York and dump power or get somewhere else? Demand side responsiveness, does everybody really want to do all the laundry at 3 o'clock in the morning? <laughs> the real thing is energy storage. That's the most effective grid balancing technology and we need to em embrace the idea. And uh, the reason is because when you're looking at systems that are out of synchronization with demand or intermittent, um, you want to improve the effectiveness of the overall system. But there are other uses in mind. So miners are often you know, slow to embrace new technologies, but Raglan has just received loads of money from Quebec and the federal government to put uh, wind turbines in. And Dyback has a system running that I saw a great presentation on at uh, WMC2. So, if you're going to do that, what kind of what kind of storage system are you going to use? And here are some of the options. Batteries are good for your laptop. You know, hydroelectric power. Well, you have to have some geology and so on. So all of these systems, we've been spending time developing. So 1991, the lithium ion. Uh, 2003, nickel cadmium. Uh, Ford Motor worked on the. Uh, Sodium sulfur back in the 1960s. And, and it's been used. They can get six hours of daily peak shaving. Peak shaving is a nice thing because when energy is expensive, you can store a little bit up, get it back when it's uh, cheap, so on and so forth. Uh, redox flow batteries. I like flow batteries because you can make bigger tanks and you're only flowing a small amount of the electrolyte across the place to power. So bigger, bigger, bigger tanks, and you can store more energy. Um, Etc. Etc. I'm just putting these up there for you to realize that it's, like I said, it's not new. Um, one of my colleagues at Nottingham were working on compressed air energy storage. Uh, the idea there was to recondition a large shaft for storage. Now you don't have a lot of large staffs around or, or salt mines to store this stuff, and you, you end up with a lot of heat coming out the jacket. Um, Raglan is looking at using hydrogen, hydrogen as a storage medium. Uh, various other uh, methods. Now hydrogen, I love hydrogen. It's good for enriching fuels, maybe 10 or 15 percent, but it, it has a very high calorific value. So it's maybe three <coughs> times or four times out of uh, natural gas it's at 120 megajoules per kilogram. So it's, it, it burns very fast and it, you have ignition issues. So most of the, uh, see all these little bits that I showed you there, out of all that, pump hydro is most of it and I'd like to see so this is not exactly new technology. The um, 1857, Siemens came up with liquid uh, liquefaction plant. And then uh, the Lynn Hampson process came along. The big difference there was the addition of the Joule Thompson effect. So it's the same system. This is one of your the production of electricity. This is the thing that we think about quite frequently. Well, this liquid air storage energy system has the flexibility. If you look on, on the grid here, you've got good, 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 good. So it compares very favorably with existing technologies and the kind of thing that you would want to do. 3 to 20 megawatts, you know, it's in the right size range for industry and it's flexible. So I'm going to leave the link 
till the end, but this is a graphic uh, courtesy of Highview Power. I'm in contact with them regularly, and uh, I, I, I met them in the UK. That's why maybe a lot of you haven't heard about this. It's a whole ocean away, but I'm sure if you just look up on the internet, you'll find that very quickly. So this is the system they use. There's a picture of the installation at Slough, just outside of London. Fantastic, it's a 300 kilowatt pilot plant. And they demonstrate with this pilot plant the feasibility of the project. But it's too small. It costs too much to make such a small plant. We need to make them larger. The fact that we're going to look at using something like liquid air energy as a storage vector can be a game changer in mind. So this is a ventilation session, so uh, 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 to bend a little bit, we're going to just go into, into auto compression just a little more than, than, than normal. A couple of things, because of the vast temperature ranges, you'll see the specific heat uh, capacity varies as a function of temperature. So I, I, you know, all these uh, massively large numbers in the graph, that's a, an equation that you put in so you get the right specific heat capacity depending on where you are. Uh, most of the time we just, uh, just use one. So you're going to calculate your auto compression temperature. It's just uh, you're probably all familiar with how that works. Uh, and then you're going to have a target underground temperature and a surface temperature. So somewhere between all these temperatures you have to figure out what's the temperature difference. And there's two temperature differences here. The temperature difference of the air and the temperature difference of the liquid. Because the liquid is so cold, uh, that's where you get the, the benefit. Uh, you, have, you have such a large temperature difference, which, which gives you the opportunity to have more heat. But the expansion is a two-phase process. It changes from a liquid to a gas, and then you have a gas, which is at minus 196. So that gas expands. So the first expansion, you get 171 cubic meters per cubic meter of liquid. The second expansion is 4.2 to go from minus 196. So all in all, you get about 718 liters of liquid per liter of air. So I've written a MATLAB program. These are the input parameters. And the thing is, is that any of these parameters can be hooked up to a sensor. So, so the program can just be iterating, and then as the sensor changes, it'll tell you, oh, you have to adjust the amounts here, the amounts of the temperatures change, the pressures change. The first thing it does is do thermodynamics, so it calculates auto compression temperature. This particular one is to 3,000 meters, but you can select whatever depth. And then we change it to normal temperatures, and uh, the blue line is the wet adiabat, and uh, the dry is red. You could be somewhere, I heard rumors that 6 degrees per thousand meters was the number that mine used, so I, I thought that's in my counter. So the next thing that happens is you lose some volume as it goes down, right? And that, that it, it's not that you lose it, it's that it's compressed, auto compression. This is the same graph as the last one, except it's just showing you actually this is how many meters I've lost depending on, on what depth I'm at. So I've got a surface temperature of 27 and a target temperature of 30. Now these calculations are done for dry air. That's the first calculation you do. Uh, this would be the mass flow rate in kilograms per second of liquid air to offset that heat at that level. Now this is for 1,000 cubic meters per second at, at any point on that graph. It's a fixed fixed numbers and different graph coming along. The next thing is, this is uh, how you determine your plant size because when you know, want to put in tons per day, we're very good at tons and mining, so this is the kind of number that you need to look at. Uh, going from there, you're not always just going to want to deliver exactly the same amount to exactly the same level. So you switch it now into meters cubed per second, and what you find out is you have a small little supplementation so this is the point. You're not going to deliver ventilation by liquid air. You're going to cool the air, and you're going to get a little bit of extra air out of that. And here's what happens if you have different flows to different levels. Of course, this is not a mine. This is just theoretically made up. You can punch any numbers in as a computer program, and they come up. So there's the numbers that I used. It's from 1,500 to 3,000 at these different uh, flow rates. The total flow is 1,000 cubic meters. But then what happens is, you get uh, this volume flow, and it's a total of 54.2 cubic meters per second. Well, if you required the flow in red, okay, that's the flow that you required, then the flow that you, the, uh, the reduction in flow that you're going to have to deliver from the fans now is the blue line. It's not that much. It's, it, 
depending on where it is, what the temperatures are, and so on, it's going to be 5 to 15 percent. But this goes both ways. Fan uh, increasing the speed by 10 percent, it's a rule of thumb, it increases your power by uh, 33 percent. So you reduce the speed, you reduce the power consumption. It, these are all part of the trade offs that have to be done to, to get some of these things sorted out. So here's an example, and I was really interested in the last talk because this is the kind of thing that we're doing. We're sending 1,200 liters per second of chilled air in a cycle. 500 liters per second of that is going to be taken up, uh, created by shipping 100 kilograms per second of liquid ice. So these are a lot of kilograms per second, a lot of pumping, a lot of pipes. And when you're pumping stuff over four or five kilometers, it doesn't come cheaply. When you're pumping it up and down two or three thousand meters, it doesn't come cheap. So this is just a flowchart diagram for cold fields. So here's a, some scenarios at 500 meters per second you, and at these temperatures. There's the difference between liquid air, ice, and water in terms of mass flow, kilograms per second, to, to deal with that uh, flow rate at these depths. Okay, depths. Um, same scenario, same relationship at 1,000 meters per second, it's just that the mass flow changes, so you see the axis, the vertical axis changes. Same scenario again for 1,500 meters, cubic meters per second, and you see what kind of mass is. Now, why do you have to have so much water compared to ice or liquid air? Well, the answer lies in the late heat of fusion or vaporization. Late heat of fusion for water is 334 joules per gram, for liquid air it's 205. But then you've got air at minus 196, and that's where you get the extra heat. So if you look at it, one of the things you got to think about here is the ice melting rate. I did a lot of work on frozen backfill, and ice just doesn't melt when you want it to. If, in fact, if we put frozen fill <laughs> into a drift uh, at Raglan and we did it incorrectly, we can stop the mine from operating for two years while we wait for it to freeze. So it's very careful <laughs> with ice and melting rates and so on. And then part of the pumping issue, just calculating, I'm not a pump expert, but one just happened to show up here. I had a great conversation. Uh, just, the, just the potential energy is the first calculation, and you, you, you start to see you're talking about how many megawatts are going to be involved here. And my timer is off because of the change, so I'm looking forward to your five minutes. Okay, all the compression is said and done. Here's the other side of the story. Um, here's a bunch of things you can do. And we haven't actually done them, but the idea is that you're not going to change the mode of operation that you have in your mind. This is going to impact the way you do things. You still can do things pretty much the same way you did. And until we get to, you know, which I think is really fantastic, stuff like this, spacesuits, well, again, <laughs> 1924, Brown and Mill figured we could use liquid air spacesuits for mine rescue. And they came up with the design and it appeared in, in the Nature. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty powerful publication. If you get in Nature, you, you're doing well. Yeah. Another thing you can do, you can produce compressed air underground in a modular system. So you don't have to send a bunch of pipes. You just need the pipes that go from the air storage to the compressed storage to there. And this can be a small modular system that can be moved around. So you don't need a plant on the surface to produce compressed air. Now, the other thing about this is, <coughs> it's going to be absorbing energy. So anytime you produce compressed air on the ground using liquid air, you're absorbing energy instead of bailing it out, which would be the thing that you would have to do. Electrical generation, same story. Uh, if I can get to this little video link, I'm going to leave to the end just in case it changes the graphics parameters. But it shows you that the, base, the generator basically fits in a shipping container size thing. You fit it on a lorry, and off you go. My Canadian friends, let's try. <laughs> so, there once again, if you have the supply available, you can put a generator there, you can get 11 kilovolts out. It's already figured out. Okay, I, I, I'm not going to figure that out. It's done. This is one of the most interesting things I think of the whole thing. If, if I were to tell you as a ventilation engineer, uh, we're going to be running some low hull dome machines here, we've got some scoops over there, and, and they're going to be absorbing uh, 1.5 megawatts of heat out of the system so that they can run, and the exhaust is going to be nice, fresh, clean, cool air. You'd probably think I'm talking about Star Trek or something, but the guy already invented it, 
he's driving around on um, streets in the UK, and Ricardo, which is the largest or second largest engine, they, they've taken on development of the engine. And the development is very simple, because in the words of one of the presenters, if you took this vehicle into your mechanic for repair, he would recognize it as a piston engine. And he would turn to you and say, you've got, you've got a funny intake here, what, what's with that? So it, the, 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 pro, the prototype development that they're doing consists of buying a vehicle and changing the intake. So this is not going to take a long time. And they're projecting to have buses and trucks on the road in 2016. And those are like major size vehicles. Now there's, there's other things. You can do a hybrid. We have electrical hybrids that you have to go plug in for eight hours or something to charge up. You can do a, a hybrid with liquid air, and it's a pumping liquid fuel. So you pump it in a few minutes, just like your gas and your diesel. And then it is so good at absorbing the heat compared to any other thing, like an organic Rankine cycle or anything like that. Because of the low, low temperature, you're changing your efficiencies from 20% to 80%. So you can reduce your diesel consumption in a hybrid by 30 to 50%. That's based on buses. All right, so another thing you can do is uh, oh, reflection. Another thing you can do is just create a liquid air booster fan. You're going to have an expanding gas, and it, it does work. So you would not, you could use a liquid air supply on a fan and uh, make it operate and blow air and provide, but you won't have to hook it up to electricity. Provided you happen to have some liquid air available. You can do localized chilling uh, by adding a little bit more air into the air flow. So you're running your fan, that's absorbing some energy and providing air. Then you add a little more liquid into the flow, and you can cool a place. So I've got some numerical modeling and so on to show that and invent it a little, you know, preliminary. Next thing you do is uh, we, we like ventilation on demand, but you know, I spent five years working on 68 at Crazy. And any time we slowed down the ventilation or did some, uh, you know, maintenance or something, it it got really hot really fast. And then you, it took it could take a long time to recondition and cool down. So if you uh, this is a simulation, okay, it's all just a computer model. But if you have cold air, you, you, uh, and it's at four different times: 0.35 days, 1.74. You know, I apologize for the stupid days, but it's a computer. It, that's the days that it's doing. Right. So you get the idea. This is a, dr a drift that's 250 meters long, and the, the, along the length of the airway are the temperatures. So the red line is, you know, the first day, and the blue line down here is 60 days, later, two months. So this is the kind of this is where the that data came from. This is the actual simulation. So it, it, it inside, and then I've just put, you know, fit the square peg in the round hole. I mean, that's, that's what you see, because the heat sort of smooths out. So you can see how the rock is conditioning over time. And there, uh, you can see it better because it's a nice side view. So these are the flow trajectories in blue, that's the drift. And then these little things are the temperature. So that's based on a rock temperature of 335K. So you have to do your 273 to figure out what that is. So energy distribution for a deep mine up to 5,000 meters. Now this is not something I figured out. This was uh, the Australian uh, deep mine back in 2000. They came up with these numbers. It was uh, based on the MinCon mine economic forecasting model that Agnico Gold did in 1999. So, so, and what I'm saying is, with liquid air, well, here, let me give you another chance. With liquid air, all of these areas can be affected by how much is going to be up, uh, up to whether or not you decide to use it in that area or not. But all of these areas and those prices and percentages can be affected. <coughs> the other thing is natural gas is uh, now really to the forefront. We ought to be looking at switching to natural gas. We can get heat from natural gas a lot easier than we can from diesels. So you can use a, a gas turbine to run your ventilation system. Not from the flow. As an axial fan, it has a really nice axis, so you, you can make it go. So there's a summary of all the things that I talked about. 
And what next? Well, we need some technical feasibility, costing comparisons, and that's why that last presentation is just fantastic. Because one of the things I'm thinking about is four or five million <laughs> kilometers of pumping, and, and it's just a perfect example of how much. Okay, we, can, and we need design specifications for localized cooling and so on. There's just a cartoon of surface vehicles running on liquid air underground storage and so on. Thank Daniel again for a very, very <laughs>